looking to convert your book into an audiobook? eAudio Productions is the premier destination for audiobook productions. We combine the finest performances of our world-class narrators with the production skills of our studio experts, bringing you the highest quality audiobook productions in the industry. From manuscript to a fully produced and published audiobook, eAudio Productions is the best choice for authors and publishers. Contact us today for a free consultation. Visit us at eAudioProductions.com. You're listening to the Author Inside You podcast, a weekly podcast designed to motivate you to finish writing a book, choose a publisher, and build an audience. Keep listening if you're looking to get propelled into the next chapter of your life. And now, it's the Author Inside You podcast. Hello, I'm Matt Rafferty. And I'm Leah Rafferty. Joining us today is Nicola Kraus, author of nine published books, including The Nanny Diaries. Welcome, Nicola. Thanks for joining us. Lovely to be here. Well, on this podcast, we speak a lot about opportunities, and I see that you travel around the country speaking to young women about gender issues in American corporate culture. How did this opportunity begin? That opportunity came out of our second novel together. I should say that I wrote those nine books with my partner, Emma McLaughlin. Uh, and then after 15 years of writing together, we uh, consciously uncoupled. And she actually went back to corporate America. And I, since then, have been using that opportunity to write things for my own pleasure and to be able to separate out my creative work from the work that I do that you know keeps the household running. And our second book was called Citizen Girl. And it, it, to this day, we're very proud of it because we were looking at the inconsistencies of third wave feminism. When we were on tour with Nanny Diaries, it was a moment that a lot of people have forgotten, but Hooters had an airline. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, we would we would come up the escalator uh, to look for our flight and be like, how is this happening? Yeah. Uh, you know, the Iraq war had just started and there was a very sort of for the boys mentality that was starting to pervade everything. Coupled with this moment where Madison Avenue was really rebranding sexism as feminism, there were these cake parties, uh, Girls Gone Wild, the idea that you could sort of perform your sexuality for men and somehow by choosing to do it, uh, that this was uh, an evolution uh, for women reclaiming parts of themselves. And Emma and I did not buy it. Yeah, Yay! <laughs> History has proved us right. Uh, so we wrote this book and it just it, it enabled us to meet with so many incredible young women across the country. And the gift now of having been doing this as long as we have is we've met women now who had really changed the trajectory of their careers because of that book. We met a woman who works for the FBI and she works in human trafficking. And she said, I chose that because you came to speak at my college. Wow. wow. That must have been amazing to hear someone say that to you. I know. It was really, I was like, done. I don't need to write another yeah. thing. <laughs> no, I did it. It's fine. It's great. Wow. I mean, to have that powerful impact on someone's life. That's pretty amazing. And, you know, on top of getting to work with someone that I love so much, and we had such a great time writing the books, and we really enjoyed the process, which I think is first and foremost uh, the goal, right, for every writer. It shouldn't, shouldn't feel like torture, although some days it does. And then to find out that people have received it in such a way is extraordinary. Well, what was it like when the Nanny Diaries went to number one on the New York Times bestseller list? Deeply, deeply surreal. Emma and I had met at NYU and actually we met after we graduated. We never really got up the courage to talk to each other in class. <laughs> and we discovered that we were both nannies and that we were both dividing our schedule between working on the Upper East Side and then skedaddling down on the subway to class, which was really unusual at that time. I think it's much more common for young women to come to the city and to use childcare as a means of supporting themselves. But at the time, we were really outliers, and both of us found it to be a deeply heartbreaking experience. And over the next five years, we got very busy with trying to start our lives. But every time we'd run into each other, we would talk about it. 
And then when I was uh, 24, I invited her to a reading of a play that I'd written. And she sent me an email the next day and said, hey, do you want to write a book about nannying? (laughs) (laughs) Wow. I was like, well, that sounds incredibly depressing, but sure. Wow. And that question changed your entire life. (laughs) Changed my entire life. And that's actually why her name comes before mine on our books, because even though that's not alphabetical, it was her idea. Okay. I I would not have had that idea. I was was trying to apply to med school. I was doing all these other things. And one, so we wrote the book sort of in a fever dream. Um, We wrote it incredibly quickly. We've never written anything as quickly again. Uh, It really just sort of poured out of us, even though we were writing every other scene and then sort of stringing them together. And we weren't, we had no expectations for anyone reading the book, which sounds strange, but we were just so committed to getting this out. And also coming from NYU, being in New York City, all of our friends were doing one thing during the day and trying to do something else in the evenings. So everyone was in a theater group or they were making sculpture in their bathroom. The idea that we would be writing a book didn't seem like it was about to be the beginning of a career. And certainly we had intimations along the way that it was being received very positively. We sold the film rights a year before the book came out. Oh, We'd I sold, didn't, wow. oh, we didn't yeah. see that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That was shocking. Yeah. <laughs> and then we had sold the UK rights before the book came out and we actually toured in England because it came out in Europe a little bit ahead of coming out in the U.S. So we'd already had a little bit of an inkling of the interest that it was garnering overseas. And we knew we were going to be on the Today Show the morning of publication. We still didn't know that that was going to translate into people buying it. (laughs) (laughs) And we went to the Barnes & Noble on um, somewhere in Midtown on 3rd Avenue uh, near the TV studios at the very end of our first day. And we walked in and asked them if they had the book because we hadn't actually seen it in the wild yet. Oh my gosh. And the guy looked at us. He's like, oh my God, no. All right, look, we're ordering more. Oh. And we're like, what? (laughs) Sorry. He's like, everyone just stop. All right. Like, yeah, we sold out of them this morning. We're getting more. And we're like, oh, okay, thank you. We're like, wait. And so I was like, how many copies did did you have this morning? He said 40. And I'm and I look at each other. I'm like, well, I have five friends. I have five friends. And And I'm like, oh my God, so of those people are strangers. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. And what's so lovely about this story is 15 years later, we were doing a reading at the Barnes Noble at 86 and 3rd and the manager came over to us and he said, I just want to tell you, I just started at the Barnes and Noble downtown the day that you guys came in. <laughs> oh. And it was so sweet how completely taken aback you were that we'd sold 40 copies. Well, isn't that neat? And that you got to see that gentleman again. That is pretty neat. That's that's, we're like, oh, that's cute. That's so sweet to share that memory with you, and that you (laughs) you held it. It's so adorable. Yeah. So that then it just we were doing media every single day, and they couldn't keep up with demand. They started printing the cover without glossing it. And we watched it rise in the rankings. And funnily, the day that it went to number one, I'd actually burned my hand the night before, like really badly. And Emma and I had been in the emergency room all night. And I was sitting on my couch, you know, on Vicodin. Uh. (laughs) We got the call. I was like, I wish, I just kept saying, I wish I was sober for this moment. Wow. But it was, it was extraordinary. It was really extraordinary. We were grateful for every single person who bought every single copy and getting to travel across the country and speak to people and speak to nannies. That oh, was the, I bet the that real would, gift yeah. of it. I mean, this, I, we will never forget this one woman who stood up in San Francisco holding a very large child sleeping, like almost like an inner tube around oh, her uh-huh. and saying, I've never had anything to point to, to explain what I do or why it matters to me so much. So thank you. Oh. And, I mean, wow. again, like you don't need more than that. Right, right. Well, that's what's so nice is that you have direct contact first off with your audience and you get to hear their responses. That in itself is special. I'm sure there's certain people who do never hear from their audience. So that's nice. So even before the book was published, you guys are already off and running. You have the movie deal. You're going to Europe. I mean, network um, TV, network TV. I mean, that just had been a little overwhelming. How did you process all this? It was profoundly overwhelming and it took us years to process it. We were really shot out of a cannon and we were so young. We had no media training. We were also really nervous because we understood that 
it's not as if this was a wholly embraced narrative. You know, people were angry at the idea of the help speaking out. Mm. So we we went into a lot of interviews that were hostile. Um, oh. People also really wanted us to name who we had worked for. And we kept trying to emphasize this was a novel. We were not actually one person. Yeah. We chose the yeah. title <laughs> Diary as a joke. Uh-huh. Um you know, that we'd actually attended a great books program. We both grown up in households where books were the religion and that this was, this was truly a literary endeavor for us. And it's so funny now, all these years later to think that there would just be one obnoxious person on the Upper East Side. Like if we, <laughs> like, yes, right. oh, it's, it's, a, it's a whole group actually. <laughs> um, you know, and we kept trying to say that the experiences we had were hard and painful. They were not the stuff of social satire. They were not the stuff of comedy. That it took some some perspective and some analysis to try to sort of mine that for what what about it was would be entertaining. Uh, which I think, if that's the kind of book you're trying to write, then that's that's the job, right? Is to figure out. You know, and I work with so many people who are writing memoirs and not that they need to make their story entertaining, but to, to reach a point in the process where you're able to have a little bit of distance and perspective, because I think one of the most challenging things about memoir and our book was not a memoir to reemphasize, but to write anything that is inspired from an experience, you have to be willing to have a certain amount of distance on it. And also just because something happened to you does not make it entertaining or does not mean that it serves the book. Mm -hmm. One of our podcast listeners asked, who did you consider to be your audience when you wrote The Nanny Diaries? That is such a good question because that is the first question that I always ask clients. Who's your audience? Who's your reader? Who is your ideal reader? Mm -hmm. And it stumps people nine out of 10 times. It brings them to a screeching halt. They sometimes (laughs) have to go away and think about it and come back. We really wrote it for each other, strangely. Um, I think we had a lot of heartbreak that we needed to cathart. And one of the things that I think we we delighted in was constantly making the other person laugh. Um, that if if I was able to capture Greer or capture Mrs. X in a way that rang true to Emma, or she was able to do the same for me, we'd consider it a, a day well done. Mm-hmm. You know, it was sure. yes. And uh, so we didn't imagine an ideal reader. In all our subsequent projects, once we actually had a readership, we absolutely started to think about the women we'd met on tour. What were they thinking about? What did we think that they would enjoy reading? Um, But that was nowhere in our little 24-year-old brains the first time. I also wanted to go back and just say something about hearing from your readers. Um, something that I always tell my clients after their books have been published, it's so important to remember that nine out of 10 times, the person who loved your book is going to take that love to the grave with them. They might tell someone over dinner, but often the people who take to Amazon are the cranky people. And you just have to take that with a grain of salt. It just is the nature for whatever reason of the human brain at this moment in history So don't let it skew your perception of how the book is being received, because for whatever reason, love seems to be quiet and crankiness is loud. Well, thank you for sharing that, because people who listen to our podcast, sometimes they are a little shy about what will the reaction be. So I think that's important for people to hear. Think about all the things you've loved. How many of them have you slowed down to leave a positive review about? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have a question from another audience member of our podcast, and Joe wanted to know, What attracted your work to your agent? That is a wonderful question. And I can definitely speak to the process of querying agents and trying to appeal to agents. Um, First, I will say in our personal experience, Emma had worked next to a guy whose mother had been in publishing. So we had sent her um, uh, the prologue and a letter. And she had suggested five agents she thought we should meet with. We met with the first one and she had been a nanny. Oh, that's interesting. And so she completely understood what what it was we were trying to do. And she immediately saw the commercial appeal of it. I think it, it, to an extent that we didn't understand yet at all. And actually it was her idea that instead of doing it as a series of essays, we should do it as a novel. So credit, credit to her. 
And we were like, oh, how do two people write a novel? And we had no blueprint for that, but we set off. We're like, challenge accepted. So that is highly unusual. The process that most of my clients go through is if it's fiction, they write the whole manuscript. If it's nonfiction, they've written a proposal. And then they have to send a one-page query letter. And I find the query letters that do the best are the ones that balance a sexy summary with a little bit of marketing savvy. And I think that for most authors, it's very uncomfortable to think that they're going to have to put a marketing hat on and that they're going to have to do it quite as soon. But it's so important to remember that agents aren't looking at whether or not they like a book or even love a book, but simply, can they sell this book? And how many hours will it take them to sell that book? And will they make enough money off of that sale to to justify those hours? That is truly the only question they are asking themselves. So a way that you can help do part of their job for them is to list any affiliations you have or any plans that you have for marketing the book. Um, And again, it, it doesn't have to be that you have, you know, enormous connections or your cousin is Oprah. It can be It can be small, um, but I think even showing that you've started to think along those lines um, to say, you know, this is my, my, I plan to do a local library tour in in my state and the adjacent three states, or, um, you know, I'm heavily involved in my JCC and I plan to speak at JCCs across the country. Just something to show that you understand that part of the onus of marketing this book is going to fall on your shoulders. That is very appealing for agents and editors. So I always have like a tight, a tight emphasis on tight. Um, so often clients will send me a version of their query letter that is two pages long. And I say, you are sending this email to someone who is just trying to quickly clear out the query inbox while they eat a sandwich and are probably doing something else on their computer. You want to grab their attention really quickly, give them like three or four tight sentences on the plot, a couple of sentences on your marketing plan and, and, and out. Be very respectful of their time. So just maybe two or three paragraphs total? Total. Do not waffle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Also, if you can't write a tight letter, they're not going to be very optimistic about your ability to deliver a tight manuscript. Sure. And then make it a formal letter with the greeting and the address yes. at the top. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and respectful and, and grateful for the time and attention that they're going to give your work. Excellent. Good idea. And be patient. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> sometimes it takes weeks to hear back from people. And that is totally normal. Um, some people only look at their query inbox every few weeks. And sometimes they don't make the time to look at their, at the actual attachments and, you know, and they'll do it like over Thanksgiving break or over the holidays. So uh, again, just patience. And what about requerying somebody, sending a letter again? Do you recommend that? I don't. I think they got it. Um, They may not have had the good manners to write back and at least say, thank you so much at this time. We are not interested or, um, but I, I don't. I've never seen that lead to a productive outcome. (laughs) Okay, excellent. So we've touched upon subtly about your business of finished thought. Can you tell us a little bit how that began? Yes, about six years ago, Emma and I decided that we wanted to do different things. Emma had come from something called C-suite coaching. So she'd been working with executives and CEOs to help them run their organizations better better on every level, like better on a really human level so that work just feels better for everybody. And that's what she was doing before the Nanny Diaries. And she really wanted to get back to it. And I wanted to do work that really fell outside the scope of our partnership, where it was hard for us to branch out of commercial women's fiction or doing rom-com writing for Hollywood studios. And we're just interested in so much more than that. So Emma moved on and formed a wonderful organization called Advisor E. And I started the Finish Thought, which initially we were doing together, but very rapidly Advisor E took off. And and that's what she's doing full time now. And I wanted to take what I'd been doing for friends and friends of friends for many years, you know, helping them shape their manuscript, connecting them with agents, helping them with the marketing part and formalize it into a business. And I've loved it. So I've been doing that for 
six years now. And it enables me to have two or three hours every morning to do the work that I love to do. So I've been working on a sci-fi graphic novel. I'm working on a sci-fi YA novel now. Um, I'm working on a screenplay that, that's being produced and hopefully will be shot in the spring. And so you have a it lot allowed, going on. <laughs> I have a lot to, to separate out my day so that I could sort of think about, I mean, other things. Um, I do a lot of work in the, in the area of like neuroscience. It's really, really fun for me, but, uh, it also was an outcropping of where journalism and where the industry of writing was at the time that Emma and I separated. When we first parted, all I care about is that I get to write every day. That really is, I really don't actually super care what I'm writing. I just want to write. It was a wonderful time to be starting to do the kind of work that I do through the finished thought because publishing has contracted so much that editors don't really get to edit anymore. So they're looking to acquire manuscripts as close to done as possible. Wow. And so that means one, people like to hire me before they even send their manuscript out to agents or editors. And then I've been hired by publishing companies to edit manuscripts that they're about to print and realize need help very fast. And I never imagined that would happen. I even had one book I worked on that was already printed and it was actually the publicist who contacted them and said, we can't send this out. It is not English. Oh, wow. And the publisher hadn't even noticed. And it was a wow. big author for them. In mm. fact, I think the author was so big, they just went on autopilot and just oh. pushed it through okay. and hadn't noticed. So they hired me and they gave me, I think it was something insane, like 72 hours to just completely edit the entire manuscript. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> bananas. I didn't sleep. Yeah. Uh, but so if, if you are working in, um, you know, in pursuit of supporting any step of that process, this is actually sort of a good moment because the publishing houses aren't able to do what they were doing for authors, again, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's just not possible. Wow. That's hmm. just so interesting, yeah. I think. It's so interesting. When we did The Nanny Diaries, our editor had maybe 20 books a year that she was moving through the process. And that rapidly up to about 50. And our editors have said to us, we, we don't edit anymore. We are facilitators. That is our job. Um, and it's hard for, you know, less experienced authors. Um, and it can make them very nervous because they want to trust that a really good savvy set of eyeballs has been on their manuscript before it reaches the world. And they don't always have that peace of mind. Right. Hmm. Well, as a coach, what do you think the biggest mistake you see first-time authors make? Putting everything in they've ever thought about anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> not leaving anything out. Yeah, they do not trust that there will be a second book. And they just stuff it so full. And a lot of what I help them with is actually cutting it back. You know, I think of it as the big block of marble. I'm like, there is an amazing book in here. We just have to cull away what we don't need and just <laughs> reveal the statue underneath. Right. It's probably hard to hear. It's it's painful. And nobody likes to kill their darlings, but it's not even darling killing. <laughs> I mean, a lot of times um, I have one client and her, her book is coming out shortly and it's a fabulous book. But when she came to me, she didn't trust that the reader would make any leaps. So the the protagonist would walk across the lobby, press for the elevator, get in oh, the elevator, go up the elevator, that. get out oh, of the wow. elevator. <laughs> and like we got we we know we we believe if she's on the couch, she probably sat on it. Yeah. Like, right. Just yeah. keep going. <laughs> but you don't know if you've never done this before. You know, am I am I getting it across? Are you hearing me? And also, there tends to be a lot of repetition for that very reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, repetition is something that a writer like Elizabeth Strout uses to extraordinary effect. But for most people, you have to trust that if the readers heard it, there's still 50 pages ago was only maybe 30 minutes for them. They remember, trust them and, and also don't insult them by thinking that they're not paying attention. They are paying attention. So I think, uh, trust the reader and trust that you've said it, trust that they've heard you. And Google Images, that the gift of Google Images to be able to actually, you know, you sort of remember a place from a few years ago that you want to write about, but to actually be able to very quickly get back inside the lobby of that hotel and remember what color the carpeting is or, 
you know, it's extraordinary uh, what used to take people trips to the library and, and days of research we can now do with a few clicks. It's, it's really magic. That is interesting because when you just said that about going into the lobby of a hotel, you don't think about that. But yes, that's pretty cool. It can bring back memories. Or if you're writing about a subject you don't know about, there you go. Yes. This book that I'm working on right now, it's set in the future. And I am doing a, a lot of work in Kentucky. I've actually never been to Kentucky, but it really is the perfect place to set the book. And it's so amazing to be able to use the topography maps and, and Google images and just see all these pictures of the terrain that I'm trying to describe. It's fantastic. And it saved me a trip. Sure. You can basically drive down the road with Google Maps. Yeah, you, know, in, you really can. In two different directions and right, and go down the alleys. And whatever crazy question you have, and I have a lot of crazy questions working in sci-fi, someone has given it some thought <laughs> and has an answer. <laughs> like, could squirrels survive, you know, Armageddon? Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. they, yes they could. And here's why. <laughs> oh, that's interesting, too. <laughs> we connected through Lucinda Literary. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with her? Lucinda is fantastic. We initially met because Emma and I hired her to help us with some publicity for our last book that we did together called How to Be a Grown-Up. And then I had done a proposal for a friend of mine. That was one of the first things that I did independently. And I mentioned it to her in passing. And she said, oh, are you interested in doing more of that? And I said, oh, yeah, I loved it. It was fascinating. And she said, well, I have a client who needs a proposal. I'm not totally sure I'm going to sign her yet, but you should talk to her. And her name is Susan Pierce Thompson, PhD. She is an extraordinary brain. She connected me with her client named Susan Pierce Thompson, who is a brain and cognitive science PhD. And I have been working with her now for six years. I've done three books with her, um, and her fourth one will be starting in January. Wow. She is an amazing human being. And she has helped hundreds of thousands of people lose, I think, over a million pounds now. Uh, Her specialty is food addiction and recovery from food addiction. And she is doing something that nobody else has. And I have loved every minute of getting to work with her. So once uh, I sort of started that partnership, then Lucinda connected me with a lot of clients as they've come in. So we've had this wonderful relationship where I'm serving her clients. She's serving her clients. We get to collaborate in that. And it's really, really fun. Yeah, it sounds like a nice professional relationship. Mm -hmm. When Lucinda was on our podcast, she spoke uh, about networking. And she said it's very important. And it sounds like here's an important networking relationship. Yes. And certainly networking has been incredibly challenging for all of us in this last year. How do you go and have lunch with someone? How do you go and have dinner with them? But Things are starting to pick back up, but I also want to reassure people who are not in New York City and don't feel like they have access to those same kind of events that it's also about growing your network locally and having those local affiliations, um, especially in nonfiction. It's about having the support of organizations that you um, that you can engage with naturally, easily, and with a short drive. Um, what I say to my clients who are working on a nonfiction proposal and need to start giving talks and creating these affiliations, to think of it as an act of service as opposed to asking a favor. It makes it a lot less painful because these organizations need to fill programming, even if they're filling it over Zoom. And so to say to them, hey, I have a 25 minute talk or I have a 45 minute talk. Um, I was working with a gentleman who is uh, an art dealer who's lost his eyesight. And I said, just start reaching out to organizations that service the blind across the country and say, I would like to give a talk about how I've adapted a life in the arts, a, you know, a completely visual life to, to being sightless. And I said, it's interesting. It's unusual. And, and he's like, oh, I don't know. I feel like I'm asking a favor. I said, no, you're not asking a favor. You're giving them something for free. And hopefully, eventually, there, there will be a level of demonstrated interest. And then you can get a speaking agent. And then they can charge for you to give this talk. 
but just like you have to give out free samples of your brownies, <laughs> right? you have to give away your talk for a little while in order to demonstrate that there's interest in your talk. And he had really good response from that. Excellent advice because, you know, there's a thing about we have this negative thought process in our mind and you have to change it into a positive uh, yes. thought. And you just did that with your advice to the gentleman, turned a negative to a positive. And what a wonderful advice that is. Sure. It's imposter syndrome, right? No one's going to listen to me. What do I know? I know the same as everyone else. Yes. When actually that's not true. So let's go back to the nanny diaries. When you get this wonderful news that they're going to adapt your book into a movie, did you have any control over the process? What is it like for authors to hand over their book to become a movie? It is a Buddhist practice of Zen. Oh. Um, Although I think I just combined two religions, but you... (laughs) You have to really let go. Okay. And we actually started screenwriting because we were told that we were not even in the running to adapt it ourselves. And we thought, we will never not be in the running again. Yeah. It's your book. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Um, But they wanted someone experienced. I think one of the reasons that I've been able to segue into doing adaptation work is that most authors don't really have any perspective on their book. Um, we've all seen even famous adaptations like Harry Potter that are too literal. They, they don't cut enough. You know, the math of a novel and the math of a screenplay, there is some overlap, but not a ton. You can have sort of these exploratory um, parts of a novel, right? Where you sort of go off on a, on a wonderful little tangent. You can't really have that. In, inside the math of a screenplay. Every scene has a very specific job to do and it has to constantly propel forward. And most authors don't understand that process and they're unwilling to change or lose parts of what they loved about the book. So in general, while Hollywood has enormous respect for authors, like a crazy amount of respect, if you ever get to go out there, it's like, oh, let's let's give them the good water. Um, <laughs> well, that's nice it, to know. <laughs> once they have the rights to something, they start to consider you an obstacle. And it was funny because Emma and I collaborated. We our our foundation is that there is never one way to tell a story. It's always better to have multiple perspectives. It's always better to uh, to consider multiple viewpoints. So when we finally got on set and the wonderful uh, director and writer, Sherry Berman and Robert Pulcini met us, they were a little bit sheepish. They said, we cut grandma. We're like, of course you did. And we made Greer five. We're like, you had to, you can't film a four-year-old. And they looked at us and they said, you're so sane. Oh, (laughs) interesting. (laughs) We understand. Like you have to adjust the given circumstances Mm -hmm. for the medium, of course. So... We, we are very, um, we're very adept at understanding that, that it's really a, an issue of translation, but for most authors, for friends of ours whose work has been adapted, it, it's painful. Um, I have a friend who had her show made into a TV series, which sounds you know, amazing. And she was so clear about what she wanted. She just wanted the opportunity to get to the next thing. And she knew this first round was going to be excruciating. Because the showrunner that they hired did not want her anywhere near set, but she was determined not to let it get completely taken away from her, not to be marginalized. So she would show up every morning and she'd smile and she'd bring people cupcakes and then Uh she'd go out in her car and cry and then she'd come back Uh (laughs) and pretend like it was all completely fine and that she didn't mind being treated terribly to her face. And... it was very strategic and very intelligent. She never lost her patience. She never pretended to let anyone know it was getting to her. And with her second book, then they let her come on as a writer. Wow. And she got to have control because she kept it together. But it was excruciating. Well, good for her. I give right. her a lot of credit. I applaud Me her. too. Good it was her. really, yeah. sh- she's 10 years younger than me and she is my Yoda. <laughs> but it's just a shame that she had to act like that because of the way people treated her. Mm-hmm. And another woman to boot. She was really disappointed by that. Mm. But I think it was, you know, I I got here. I'm the only woman here doing this. You're oh. 30 years younger than me and I, okay. you are not taking my job. Mm-hmm. All right, got it. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. Got it. So tell us about the process going from adult fiction to a young adult fiction. We loved writing young adult fiction. Having both worked in childcare and in service of degrees where we were using theater, Emma was working with children who were coming from at-risk backgrounds, and I was using theater as a tool to work with children on the autism spectrum. We just love kids. And even though teenagers are just slightly younger adults, they have brains that are still developing, so wildly impressionable going through the exhilaration of so many firsts. It's it's a really, really fun age to write. And it was incredibly attractive to us. Funnily, when our books came out, they had no vampires in them. <laughs> and it was not the right moment for that. But I really stand by those stories. The Real Real is about a girl who lives out at the edge of at the end of Long Island in the year-round community. You know, the bus boys and her mom's a maid. And then MTV comes to her high school to film the real East Hampton. (laughs) And they give each kid a $40,000 scholarship from Doritos to participate. So they have to work Doritos into every scene. And she watches her life suddenly become not her own. And when we did it, you know, the powers that be kept saying, well, no one wants to see behind the scenes of a reality show. Oh. Now, now everybody knows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think, think so. Yeah, I want to read this We're like, book. you know, no, it's all fake. And we had, you know, going back to the joys of going to NYU, we had friends who were working at MTV at, you know, at night and taking classes during the day or vice versa. So we had friends who were producing the very first reality shows. So we had been hearing for years about how completely conjured the whole thing was. And we thought, well, wouldn't it be amazing to put a 17-year-old in that? Yes, that's, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes, I I love that book. I love that book, The Real Real. Yeah, that sounds um, great. Yeah. We'll have to check it that was, out. Everyone should check it out, right? <laughs> Everyone should check it out. Now, yeah. now that we're in a world, we can all admit that reality shows are fake. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we can hear about the behind the scenes. Yeah. <laughs> Which I can't, everyone's always wanted to know behind the scenes, right. it seems like to me. But right? you know, maybe we just, maybe we like that. Yeah. You know, that, it, you know it, it's a very funny thing being, you know, with Nanny Diaries, we, we really capture the zeitgeist at the exact moment. But then um, we wrote this other book called Between You and Me that came out in 2012, I think, um, about uh, a girl who's a famous pop star whose abusive father traps her in a conservatorship. Ooh, are <laughs> wow. you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. We, maybe the dad, maybe Britney Spears' dad read that. <laughs> oh, he spiked it. He oh, spiked he did? it. Oh. Yeah. Jamie Spears uh, kept the book from being publicized. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And we lived through that. And now this has all come to pass. But when Wait. we were trying in vain to promote that book, nobody wanted to hear about the idea that Britney Spears might be getting kept hostage by the very man who broke her in the first place. We thought it was an amazing story, but trying to research conservatorships before anything had been written about it in the media, that was a deep dive. Wow. Wow. So maybe you should re-release it. We, so we said to Atria, like, come on, re-release it. Like, this is so topical now. Well, right. Yes. Oh, that sounds tiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it does. Well, Nicola, it's yeah. been great having you on our show. Thank you very much for all the advice that you've you've shared with us. And I think anybody who's listened can definitely gain something from what you've shared. You are so welcome. This has been an absolute delight. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Take care. You too. Bye. It was wonderful talking to Nicola today. To find out more about her business, The Finished Thought, go to thefinishedthought.com and find out how she's a personal trainer for your creative process. And we'd like to give a huge shout out to our friend Elias and the team over at eAudio Productions for doing the post-production work on our podcast. And if you'd like to reach out and give us a comment, you can call us on our phone. It's 475-4-PODCAST, 475-476-3227. And until next time, right on. Thank you for listening to the Author Inside You podcast with your host, Leah and Matt Rafferty.